Well, good morning and welcome. Last Sunday we launched a teaching series here in the book of James, uh, focusing on what it means to have an authentic faith in the Lord. And together during this series time, we're going to consider that theme, that uh, genuine faith, and, and learning how to live out that authentic, genuine faith. Really a faith that works, a faith that says to the world around us, we live for God and we seek to glorify Him in and through our lives. Because I don't know about you, I didn't, I didn't join church just to be able to have another thing to do. I didn't just come part of God's family so that I could feel connected to a few other people who were kind of like me. I came to a saving faith in Jesus Christ because I knew that without him I would perish. And that I was a sinner in need of his grace. And there was nothing in all of this world that I could do that would make him love me any more or any less than he already did. And that through faith in him and faith alone, I was saved and then captivated by that abundant grace and mercy that flowed every day that was teaching me the ways of God. Getting rid of my stuff and putting on the things of God. So having authentic faith in a world that lives apart from him is not easy, but that is what the book of James is here to teach us. And so I'm excited to press on in James chapter 1 with you this morning, part 1 of what it means to have an authentic faith under trial, as we look at verses 2 through 12 here this morning. Last week we got all the way through verse 1, and so today hopefully we can get through the next 10 verses of this teaching series, part 1 of this time of authentic faith under trial. And I want to encourage you to remember to read through the book of James at least once during the week. First chapter, verse 1, all the way through the end of chapter 5. It should take you about 15 or 20 minutes. And each week when you do this, it's going to give you some great background for where we're going. And then as we proceed, it will remind you where we've been and help connect everything really beautifully together and really help you engage in our teaching time each Sunday over the next several weeks. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we can come to you in any moment of our lives, even now, and to seek you, to pray to you, to ask you, Lord, to fill us anew with your presence. And that's what we ask, Lord. As we read your word this morning, as we consider your holy word for our lives, give us ears that hear and a heart that wants to obey. Help us, Lord, understand those areas of our life that are not yielded fully to you. And may we respond in obedience to what you are showing us and leading us to do this day. We love you, Father God, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. What makes you most happy in this life? What makes you most happy? For some people, it's cute puppies, right? They get excited and they feel all this joy when they're petting, you know, these puppies and, and seeing those things. Um, and some people, they, they get great happiness when they, when they taste the most delicious piece of cake, you know? There's these little moments, these little experiences that bring us joy and happiness. Sometimes it's that first real sunshine in the spring after kind of a long, cold winter. Or maybe for you it's the first snowfall. Those simple little moments that bring you joy. Maybe it's an expression you hear from someone. Maybe it's a phone call from someone you haven't heard of for a while. Different things, different moments bring us joy. And the word of God that we're going to get engaged in today, it starts off with a very powerful phrase. It says, consider it all joy, meaning have nothing but joy, meaning supreme joy, meaning it's more than the cute puppies, the chocolate cake, or your favorite team winning the big game, more than the first snowfall, the first rain, or the first sunshine after a cold winter. Biblical joy is that experience and knowledge of deliverance, of being saved and delivered. So although joy is closely linked to an emotion we might have related to gladness or happiness in the moment, joy is more, especially according to God's word, a state of being rather than an emotion. But it's a state of being as a result of a choice. Joy, biblical joy, is also mentioned in Galatians chapter 5 as one of the fruits of God's Spirit in you. His joy. 
And having joy is part of what it means to be set apart by God for his holy purposes. And yet, statistically, we know that some of the people who struggle with real joy, the most are even those within the church. Those who call themselves disciples of Christ. And so know then that an authentic faith in God, especially one under trial, is not a faith in God that is absent of true joy. Rather, an authentic faith under trial produces godly, lasting joy. A joy that does not hinge on whether your team wins the big game or whether that piece of cake is actually that good. A joy that lets you know in the midst of your storm that God is in control and he is so worthy of all your prayers. So as we learned together last week in our opening of this teaching series in the book of James, James, the half-brother of Jesus, was writing the early church, and the early church was dispersed. They were under great persecution. They were in the midst of great suffering. And as these people have been coming to Christ, they were being rejected and even attacked for their faith. So I want to encourage you, if you haven't done so already, to turn in your Bibles to the book of James, chapter 1. We're going to pick up in verse 2 this week. And I ask that you use your electronic devices or your Bibles or the Pew Pocket Bibles and read along with me so that you can actually see that I'm not making this stuff up and I'm not reading from the book of Nick, but rather from the Holy Word of God. And I want to engage in another place of your heart and your senses as we encounter God's truth for our lives. James chapter 1, verse 2. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways." But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position, and the rich man is to glory in his humiliation, because like flowering grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and its flowers fall off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. Verse 12, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Authentic faith under trial. This is what these verses remind us of. And verse uh, 2 starts off very clearly talking about joy. And not just the joy you have after you've won something, but the joy that comes from knowing you are obedient to God the Father. And when James tells these readers to count what they're experiencing right now as joy, it might have caught them by surprise. Because we can connect with that, that same feeling of going through suffering and not feeling very joyful. Of having lost a loved one. Of being told bad news by a doctor or the boss. In that exact moment, we probably often lack joy. But what James is communicating to the church then and what God is communicating to his church now is very important. Suffering is not meaningless. Hardship, pain, trials, it is not meaningless. Rather, it's God's way of bringing out all the God fruit in your life. That's called spiritual maturity. It's called growing in Christ. It's called being made new, being transformed by the power of God. He uses it all for his glory. And so an authentic faith under trial understands how godly joy is produced in and through the trials we are called to face. A real faith, a lasting faith, a faith in God that stands the test of time and and, and shows something great of God to a watching, skeptical world is one that says, His joy in me is not from this world. 
and his joy that is in me will not be taken by this world. And we're going to talk much more about that because an authentic faith understands that we are to never walk through life alone. So picture it hand in hand with God, that's fine. I often picture myself strapped up in his arms and being carried by him. And I'm a big boy, but he's a big God. And I find great comfort in knowing that he carries me many, many times. Because as we've said before, we'll say it again, when we walk through the valley of the shadow, because we will, we have nothing to fear. For his rod and his staff, his provision and his protection, they comfort. This is who God is to his beloved. James is writing to the church under persecution and reminding them that God is with you. Even though you're in a new land that you've never gone before. See, you and I can hop on a plane and go almost anywhere, except a few of those countries now that aren't allowing visitors. (laughs) But you and I can get in our car, we can drive to another state within a matter of what? 35, 45 minutes, depending on how fast you drive. But people then, they didn't move like this. They stayed in their community, their region, for all of their lives, for multiple generations. And now they're being dispersed throughout the known world because of their faith in God. And he's saying, consider it all joy. Consider it all joy. Because I am with you. God the Father is with you. And so in order to pursue an authentic faith in God the Father, you and I, during each one of our trials, as our text has pointed out, we must then enable, or uh, we must then uh, exhibit these four distinct parts that the text that we've read this morning show us that calls us towards in this pursuit of an authentic faith even during trial. And the first one comes from verse 2, and it's about your outlook. And your outlook has to be a joyful attitude because it says, verse 2, look again, it says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Because what? It's been said by others, much smarter than you or me probably, that our outlook will directly determine, which means it significantly impacts the outcome. Our outlook determines our outcome. If we come into church with our arms crossed and wanting our way to be met, and then we come in here and they don't do it, and they don't sing my song, and I don't like the volume of this, and -and so-and-so didn't come and say hi to me, you're going to leave mad. I'm not coming back next week. Nobody likes me. That's what you do. When your outcome is negative before you even start the product. Outcome determines every time your outlook determines every time your outcome. If we go into something open-handed and open-hearted, then whatever happens, happens, and we're like, that's great. The first thing verse 2 says is consider your outlook, and it should be joyful. Because God has set us up for victorious Christ-like living because he says when you go through the hard stuff, your outlook needs to be pursue me and joy in the midst of it. Because you know it will come, the hard things in life, so choose an authentic and Christ-like response. That's your attitude. We cannot expect as disciples of Christ for everything to go our way, but isn't this so frustrating when it doesn't? We know it won't. We know there's going to be setbacks. Trials will come. And some simply come because of our own humanity. Sickness is part of the body failing. Accidents will happen because there is a lot of negligence and naivety out there. Disappointments still come. Other trials come because we are disciples of Christ. Because we have said, I belong to God. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13 says, Dear friends, Do not be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it's revealed to all the world. Satan's going to come against that, isn't he? He's going to try to ruin that opportunity for you to live like that for God. 
the world will continue to oppose you. Every generation of every believer has always had opposition to their faith. Don't forget, James, the writer of this, was opposed to the Messiah when he was the Lord and Savior walking the earth. And God still changed and used him. So do not forget that this world and this life we live in is a bit of a battle. But your outlook entering into each day and your pursuit of real joy every day, it matters. Your outlook will determine your outcome and your attitude will drive your action in this process. So choose joy. Choose God's joy. Choose. Because as we live in authentic faith under trial, we start to evaluate what we encounter. See, when Paul became a Christ follower, he had to stop and evaluate his life. And because his old way was not God's way, he had to, by the power of God, set new goals and priorities for his life. And he would write that what was before important to him is now but garbage. It's all but trash in light of his experience with Christ Jesus. And his life was radically different after he encountered God. When we face trials of this life, we must evaluate them in the light of what God is doing, what he has revealed to us about who he is and his plan for redemption. It's about having eternal perspective. This is why, as disciples of Christ, we can have joy in the midst of death and pain and hardship and trials because we understand what matters most. We have the end in mind. Not everyone else around us has that. Our values determine, though, our evaluations. And if we value comfort more than character, then trials will derail us. If we value stuff more than the spiritual, than the eternal, then we will not be able to count what we're going through as all joy and all glory unto God. If we live only for the present moment and what we get from this moment, not the future and what God is going to do, then trials, when they come, will breed bitterness within us and will build a barrier between us and Christ. So what can we do when trials come an authentic faith in the Lord should immediately then stop and give thanks to that God has counted you worthy to join him in this suffering. That sounds so weird to even say. But that is what we are to do. God, thank you. God, thank you. Help me in this moment to choose the right outlook in response to this, for worrying about my character and wanting me to be more and more like you. Thank you, Father. Choose that right outlook by adopting a joyful attitude in that present moment. And this doesn't mean you get to pretend or fake it until you make it. Simply look at the trial through the eyes of faith. Outlook determines outcome. To end with joy, then you have to start with joy. And this takes us to the next aspect that our text takes us through today, which is about cultivating mindfulness. Look again at the first part of verse 3. The verse, first part of verse 3 says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Authentic faith will always be tested. Sometimes people come up and be like, yeah, life is really good. And I'm like, whew, get away from me. Authentic faith will be tested. Authentic faith will be tested. God is always looking for ways in which to grow us, mature us, and refine us, and to bring out his best in us. Satan will also try to test you and tempt you. But it's to destroy you, it's to harm you. It's not to bring out the best. It's to bring out shame and failure and pain and disgust and separation from everything you value. We must be mindful 
of that continua, continuous reality and tension as we journey with God and in this process of discipleship that we're engaged in. God wants to bring out our best and to make us more like him. Satan wants to destroy us. 1 Peter verses, verse 7 in chapter 1 says, These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purified gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So know this, friends. Scripture says that this is the process and this is the goal. So we must be mindful. We have this knowledge already. Either what I'm facing will glorify God or it will drag me far away. So what will I choose? Be mindful. Know this is the reality. Be mindful for trials rightly used help us mature in Christ. God wants to develop spiritual disciplines in our life like patience and endurance, this verse said. The ability to keep on going when things get hard. To keep on praising, to keep on glorifying and living for God all the days of your life. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4 says, And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and per perseverance, proven character. And then proven character, Scripture says, hope. This is what this process does. An authentic faith under trial uh, guided by God brings about something very important. Because biblically, patience is not a passive acceptance of circumstances. That's what you do at the DMV. You're supposed to patiently wait, mind your P's and Q's, not roll your eyes and scoff and, and get upset because the person in front of you is a Neanderthal and can't figure out where to sign their name on the piece of paper. That's what you do at the DMV. But as a disciple of Christ, that's not what you're doing when you're patiently waiting. It's a totally different thing. Because you know that as you wait on the Lord, he's going to renew your strength. He's going to meet every one of your needs. And he's going to grow in you his character and his heart so that there becomes less of you and more of him. And when there's less of you and more of him, there is more of his rule in your life. And he is glorified. So biblically speaking, patience is not that passive acceptance of the circumstances. It's a courageous perseverance in the face of the hardness and the realities of this brokenness and sin in this world. Cultivate that kind of godly mindfulness. Those who are immature spiritually are often impatient. Maturity has learned to be patient and persistent. And so often our immaturity goes with our unbelief, with our lack of, while authentic faith goes with patience. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 12 says, Be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Be like them, scripture says. A lack of maturity has never cultivated mindfulness, and the knowledge it does have is shallow and is lacking. For some of us, it's just time to grow. Time to grow. Because as we admit that need in our lives, the Lord will develop patience and character in our lives, and he probably will use hard things to do so. <coughs> so know this. Endurance cannot be attained by simply reading a book or listening to a podcast and even praying. We must go through life, and while we go through it, trust God, obey Him, and glorify Him in each one of those steps through our actions. So know this. We can't ask and pray in Jesus' name for him to change our circumstances or free us from this temptation and then not act by saying no to the sin and yes to him. Pray, yes. Listen to those podcasts. Yes, go for it. Read a great book written by a great person and be inspired and encouraged, but then know you have to take action. You have to do something about the knowledge that you've had. Knowing what trials will do in and for us with the end result of making much of Christ and bringing glory and honor to the Lord is very important. 
It's what transitions from just listening to a book or saying a prayer to responding in obedience to what God is doing. Because God fulfills his purposes as we trust in him. An authentic faith in God is un- understands that there is no substitute for an understanding mind. There is none. There is none, no other substitute. Romans chapter five, 15 verse 4 says, Such things were written in scripture long ago to teach us. And the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. Understand, this is the process. James writes to the early church and says, you're a part of this, so be mindful of this. Be aware of this. Create within you this space saying, now is the time for me to learn something from what I'm going through. God wants to teach me. And the reality is, is Satan does not, is not able to easily defeat those who are living in God's promises for their life. Who understand God's word, who seek his truth for their lives above all else. Satan cannot easily defeat them. But he can many other types of people. Satan cannot easily defeat those who are willing to stop and wait and be mindful of what God is up to. And say, I'm going to respond when God leads. And I'm going to respond in a way that brings him glory and honor. And reflects his purpose for my life even in the midst of this trial. That type of mindfulness, that type of maturity that says, I will stop and wait on him. It changes everything. So cultivate mindfulness and seek to grow in godly knowledge as you patiently and passionately wait on him. Your refuge, your rock, your savior. A third aspect that our scripture talks about today is the fact of surrender. And it talks about a surrendered will. Look again at verse 4, which said, And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Who wouldn't want to lack nothing? Who wouldn't like to always log on to their bank account and be like, there's more than enough? Who wouldn't always like to, without having to go to the store, look at your cupboard and say, more than enough? Who wouldn't like to open up their lunchbox in the morning and say, already done, more than enough? Who wouldn't like to walk into their house and see that it's already clean and say, more than enough? Right? It's not like the commercial with the doctor who walks in who just got kicked out of the hospital and got his license reinstated and he's going to do the surgery for the person, right? And they're like, this is Dr. So-and-so. He's okay. They're like, okay. He goes, yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. Not a big deal. It's not just God is saying it's going to just that here's an okay thing. It's more than enough type of thing. But that becomes something you experience when you've surrendered to him. You've surrendered your will to him your life to him. That's the lacking in nothing part in response to what you have chosen to do. Jump down to verses 9 to 11 again that said, but the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position and the rich man is to glory in his humiliation because like flowering grass, he will pass away for the sun rises with the scorching wind and withers the grass and its flowers fall off and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. In the kingdom of God, it's kind of flipped upside down. The person who doesn't have anything, it says here is in the high position and the one who has it all, the rich brother, he is in the area of humiliation. The kingdom of God is much different than the world in which we live in. And God desires for each of us to grow in the mature in him and the knowledge of him and to realize that he cannot build into our character that wholeness, that perfectness, that lacking nothingness. I just made that word up. Unless we surrender to him. And I don't know if you realize what surrender is. But it's a total abandonment of your right. To win, to live, to be. It's a total surrender. It's a total giving up. Surrender means that we no longer identify with who we were, but now identify with who God says we are. His beloved, His creation, made in His image to do His good work in what we say, and in what we do, and in how we act. 
And some of us, we like to resist. We like to resist this whole surrender thing to the Lord. And sometimes he's gracious and will discipline us into submission. But once we do submit, he's then able to accomplish his work, his way, for his purpose. And God wants a finished product that is mature and complete, that lacks nothing, that is secure in him. And so we cannot shelter ourselves from trials. Because if we do, what we're saying is, I really haven't bought into who God is. Like if we try to protect ourselves from growing and maturing and experiencing what God wants to do to grow and mature us, then we've not really fully surrendered to the lordship of Jesus Christ. It means you're still driving the car, but you're okay with him hanging out in the passenger seat. That's the difference here, friends. That's sheltering yourself. That's keeping an option open for yourself. That's keeping your perspective in control. And I don't know about you, but I'm kind of a control freak, so it's really hard to yield myself in submission to the lordship of Jesus Christ every day. Because I'm pretty confident I've got some good plans going. And I'm sure you feel that way in your way as well. But surrender means you abandon it all and completely yield your life to Christ. His way, His timing. And we cannot shelter ourselves from those trials and expect to be growing spiritually. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. If you want to write that down, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. It outlines for us three specific works that are involved in a complete Christ-like life. And I want to highlight those for you. First, there is the work that God does for us. Guess what that's called? Salvation. Only God can save. He alone can redeem. He alone can give you eternal life. The first work that God does for us is salvation. Jesus Christ completed this work on the cross. And if you trust in him as your Lord and Savior, he will save you. The second, there is the work that God does in us. So he's done something for us, and then he does something in us. Scripture says we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. This is the process of sanctification. God's working in you, making you new, making you more and more like him. It builds our characters, and we become more like Jesus and reflect more and more of him in this world. Conform to his very image of his son. And third is what God does through us. He does something for us, salvation. He does something in us, sanctification. And he does something through us, service. We are created in Christ Jesus to do good works. This is what scripture says, but know this. God builds character before he calls us to serve. He must work in us before he works through us. And all of this, it requires, from, uh, it requires from us a surrendered will. A laying down of my right to be right and a cling to the power of God for my life. If we try to go through life without surrender to God, we reflect an immaturity and a self-reliance that will totally negate a joyful obedience that is needed to be an authentic follower of Christ whose faith is alive for him. God uses trials to wean us away from immaturity and self-reliance to dependence and surrender on him. See, verses 9 through 11 apply to two different types of people, apply to two different types of people, which basically includes anyone, the poor and the rich. It's not your material resources that take you through the trials, it's your spiritual resources. So fully surrender your life to God, grow in him and in the knowledge of his word, Joyfully obey him in the process of growth and transformation. Consider it all joy, knowing that he is at work in you. Let those trials strengthen you and your faith in God. And so our text today, James chapter 2, or James chapter 1, verses 2 through 12, give us four distinct parts, calling us to live an authentic faith in God even during our trials. And the first was we are to choose joy, a joyous attitude and an outlook that seeks to glorify, learn, and grow. Second, we are to cultivate mindfulness and understand 
in the knowledge and promises of God that he is and is and will take care of us. And we're to surrender over our will to the Lord. And the fourth is a believing heart. Look again at verses 5 to 8 with me. Those verses said, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he will ask, but he, who, he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For the man ought not to expect what he will receive, anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And you say, but pastor, haven't you talked about how God's okay with our doubt? Haven't you talked about how God is okay with our shortcomings and, and our lack? Yes, he is, but remember, there's a difference between staying there and admitting you're there. And James is saying, don't live there. Don't live your faith in that moment, in that way. Because wisdom, a believing heart, is vitally needed when going through trials with an authentic faith. We need to ask for wisdom and not necessarily strength or grace or even deliverance at first because we need godly wisdom first to understand what he is doing, the opportunity God is giving us, and how he would like us to follow him. That's what wisdom does. Wisdom helps us understand how to use those circumstances for God's glory and his purpose for good in our life. And these verses we read also explain how one should ask for wisdom. We are to ask in faith. Not afraid, not anxious, not doubtful. Just like God desires to give us more grace, he desires to give us more wisdom. So know this, believe this, because our text today compares the doubting believer to the waves of the sea, up one minute, down the other. This is the experience of the double-minded man, Scripture says. Faith says yes, but unbelief says no. Then doubt comes along and says yes at first, but then changes to no the next. It was doubt that made Peter sink in the waves as he was walking to Jesus. Matthew 14, 31, it captures Jesus saying, as he reached out and grabbed him, you have so little faith. Why do you doubt me, Jesus said. When Peter started this walk of faith on the water, he did so fully assured, eyes fixed on Jesus. But when he was distracted by the winds and the waves, the doubt, the anxiety, the fear, the shame, he ceased to walk by faith and he began to sink. He was double-minded and he almost drowned. But his Lord and Savior was there graciously to rescue him. So that's what we do with our doubt. Take it to the feet of Jesus and let him rescue us. Many of us live this exact way, up one minute, down the next, tossed back and forth. This kind of experience is evidence really of spiritual immaturity and exposes a lack of truly believing with your heart that God is who he says he is. Paul used a similar idea in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14 that says, this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like truth. And so, friends, if we have believing and united hearts, we can ask in faith, and God will give us the wisdom we need to glorify him and to fulfill his purposes. So know this and believe this to be true. Have that kind of believing heart in God and his promises. And our text today ends, our time together ends by looking at verse 12. I want to encourage you to look there one last time with me. Because this section closes in a beatitude. And wh the way this chapter starts in verse 2 with joy, it now ends with joy. Verse 12, it says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. God calls us to patiently endure, to live out in obedience and to model it for others, both to an unbelieving world that is all around us and to others who are followers of Christ, both to your church family and your biological family, both to your neighbors and your coworkers and your friends. 
Those who have an authentic faith under trial will be rewarded, Scripture says. I love rewards, right? That's why I've got my Smith card in there, so I get some discount on my gas. I love rewards, right? Who doesn't like to collect reward points? I get them from Starbucks every time I spend too much money on their coffee. They got me duped. But the reward with God is much greater than a few points on your Starbucks card or a few cents more off on your gas. It's way more important than that. It's way bigger than that. The first reward is Christ-like character. When I think about being a dad, sometimes I know I miss the mark. Being a husband, being a pastor, there are many times I know I miss the mark. But in God, I lack nothing. And what he wants me to understand is he wants me to still be like him. And every trial, every hardship, every temptation that we face, God is faithful to develop within us a genuine and authentic faith, one that will be rewarded by Christ-like character. Nothing changes that with God for you. He still wants you to be like him. I look at the shortcomings of uh, of people who've influenced me, and all I say is I don't want to be like that. Can I learn some other way I want to be? But with God, he's perfect, and he is complete, and he lacks nothing. And he is who I want to be like. And the second thing is you're rewarded by knowing that much has been made of God, that glory has been brought to God by your authentic, faithful obedience, even in the midst of your hardship. So one is you become more like him, and two, he becomes more glorified. And that's pretty cool. That's pretty great. So one might say that God does not help us by removing every difficult circumstance in our life or by keeping us from experiencing them. Rather, God uses the difficulties, the hardships, the trials to work in and through us to produce godly character, to produce Christ-likeness, to produce a genuine, authentic faith that brings him glory and honor. He uses every difficulty, every hardship to work in and through us. So may you remember that this week. And may we remember the heart of God and his desire for your authentic faith under trial and that spiritual maturity. One person I read this week said, let patience have her perfect work that you may be whole, wanting nothing. Another author said, you must let your endurance come to its perfect product so that you may be fully developed and perfectly equipped. So if that's what you want, then in love and devotion to Christ, choose joy in your attitude and your outlook regardless of what you encounter. Walk into the doors of the sanctuary of the church or the office that you reside in and know going in you're choosing joy to glorify God the Father. Out of love and devotion to Christ, choose joy and cultivate a mindfulness by knowing the word of God and surrendering then your will over to the lordship of Jesus Christ so that you can with a believing heart in God the Father Trust in his promises, obey him completely, walk on water towards him, and not sink. So that you will not be tossed around by the waves of this world and influenced by its schemes. Because when God's people go through personal trials, they discover what kind of faith they really possess. Because trials not only reveal our faith, they also develop our faith and their character. Those Jews whom James was writing to were experiencing some great persecution and some horrible trials, and he wanted to encourage them, and he does so by telling them to choose joy. So friends, rejoice as you pursue God and an authentic faith in him alone, even in the midst of your trials. He is with you, he believes in you, and he's calling you to walk on water towards him in faith knowing that all you're going through, he has a plan. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the opportunity we have to be able to look at your truth for our life. 
Help us to understand what you, Father God, have said to us today through your holy word. Help us to understand, even in this moment, what you've made us aware of. And Lord, may we respond in obedience to you. May we share with others, Lord, how we, how we can be prayed for, how we need help. And God, may we respond in obedience to all that you have called us to. Help us to understand how character matters more than anointing and how an authentic faith in you pulls people away from themselves into you and the hope we found in you. May we be those kind of people, people of God, consumed by your love, devoted to your lordship, who are developing every day our faith in you, an authentic faith, even in the midst of trials. We love you, God, and we, we pray these things in your name. Amen.